check. Usually, not when I sit down, I unplug yeah, my stuff. Yeah, That's fine. No problem. But before before we start, I want to ask you what what is your favorite? Because now we're talking about Matu Salem and Cuba okay. and all that. What is your favorite the Cuban Mexican. phrase? My favorite Cuban phrase. Oh man. Coño is a good one, right? But, <laughs> coño but, is the equivalent of like, damn, damn it. Yeah, damn it, damn yeah, it, or, yeah. uh, or cojone. <laughs> cojone. Translate cojone. It's like saying the F word, like when you go, okay. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, but the way you say it, it's almost like you don't pronounce the C. It's like, cojone. It's like cojone. A, oh. <laughs> the Cuban slang is a whole different animal from Spanish. And I, I, I asked that because I was dealing, I've been dealing with, different people in the last 72 hours and a phrase that my grandfather always said, and I don't know if it's strictly specifically Cuban, but his phrase, everybody that, that didn't line up with him was sinvergüenza. Oh, sinvergüenza. Everybody. <laughs> like I, I'm talking the guy that would, for example, he, he would loan people money, uh -huh. right? And that wasn't his business, but he was just a kind person and he would loan people money. And then he would see that they had a party before he got his money. Sinvergüenza. Yeah. The guy that would cut him off on the freeway, sinvergüenza. <laughs> like it didn't matter. Yeah. Everybody. He was and a that, jerk. <laughs> and I, I always just related it to just, yeah, he's a jerk. Yeah. But when you break it down, oh, yeah. sinvergüenza. And I think there are so many of those people. <laughs> They just don't have it's it's literally without shame. Yeah, without shame. Yeah. And there's so many of them. And I've I've dealt with these people recently in outside businesses and it's just their outlook is how can you help me? Yeah. And if your house is burning down, sorry, but can you still help me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, wow, that that's real. Like sinvergüenza is like you are that person, you know, like that's, that's who these people are. So it, it all goes back and, and I've had a great time thinking about that. And there's millions of phrases. That's why I asked you if yours, when you, what yours was. When you talk to older Cuban, I mean, when I talk to my mom sometimes and, and different conversations or if she's excited or something, you hear these words that you haven't heard in a while. Yeah. You know, like caballero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, Caballero's caballero, a good one. you can use it as a, hey, this is, you know, he's a gentleman. gentleman. Or just, hey, people. <laughs> It's like saying caballeros. Folks. It's like saying folks. Yeah, yeah, hey, folks. Caballero. <laughs> let's uh, let's pour a drink here. Before we start, we have to say thank you to our man here, uh, Frankie Micheladas and Micheladas Antojitos, the number one, the original, the greatest Michelada cup, the OG. And they have these back. These are peach rings with chamoy. Oh, We're going to open these up. Guns. They're absolutely fantastic. We're going to pour some of this. This is uh, Blind Pig from San Dimas Liquor. Right. And usually... San Dimas Liquor, Nate, uh, he's here with us normally, and his son does our, uh, you know, production, and he's on the computer looking stuff up for us, and he's, he's helping out. But unfortunately, they had uh, an incident. They had a death in the family, so my condolences, condolences to you, Nate, yeah. and your family, and we love you, and, and we'll see you back here next week. But cheers to Frankie, cheers to San Dimas Liquor, and cheers, cheers to you. Thank you. I love this cup. So I remember when I first saw them and I was like, oh man, these are great. They are great. And, and they're great for any occasion. Came up with it, yeah. And you can, you can put, you know, this is like an IPA or something yeah, and it works good. fine. Yeah. And, and you can put in soda yeah. and it works fine. And then a little bit later, we're going to try this rum that you brought. And we're going to try that in there before we keep going. Cause now we're, we're just snowballing. <laughs> I want to introduce who's sitting here with me today. This is Mr. Robert Vargas. Robert is a friend of mine. He's a member of Tropicana. He has become um, a major, major part of the club and a major part of my everyday life because I see him every day. His, his kids and, and, and my kids go to school together. He is also my financial advisor, which if you know me, you know I don't play with my money. <laughs> and and it's, it's very... I've only had one other one in, in my life um, who I trusted with my savings, and, and that's a big thing. 
And I feel that Robert has a similar background, grew up somewhat similar. He values the same things that I value with family and money and saving. And, and we kind of, I think, uh, well, he's Cuban, born in Cuba. Born in Cuba. My mother's born in Cuba. And that's a, a, a country where you're grinding. You are grinding not only for money, but to stay alive. Yeah. And that is something that was put into my head as a four year old, like save your money because maybe one day somebody's going to come and take it all. Yeah. And as a four year old, you know, my kids don't think like that because I don't put that in their head. But I, that was put in my head. Like you need to make sure that you watch every cent and you don't buy anything unless you absolutely needed. Yeah, you got your needs, your wants, right? It, it, it wasn't even wants. There was no wants. It was needs. And that's it. And if the needs decided to, you know, break, then you had to replace it. But no wants. There was no wants. There was no wanting. So I feel like we have similar upbringings with that. And that's why I know that you will take care as best to your ability of my financials the same way that you would take care of yours. Yes. And yes. a financial advisor is somebody that you can, you're literally trusting with your life savings. So you have to have a lot of confidence that they are a smart and reliable. And, um, and that's why, that's why I have you. So I appreciate that. I want to tell you that I appreciate thank that. You, thank you. And I'm not trying to plug him for anything, but Hey man, he's a good dude. And, uh, he can do stuff for your money that you probably didn't know you could do. And it's not, only if you have millions of dollars, it's, it's anything. And, and uh, you know, let's talk about that because I think a lot of people think that in order to have a financial planner and in order to have an IRA and this and the other, you have to be super wealthy. And that's not the case. That's not the case at all. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I want to say thank you sure. for inviting me, you know, to do this today. Um, I value our friendship a lot. You know, our, our kids go to school. I value you not only as a client, but as a friend and you know getting to know you has been great getting to know your your mom as well yep. getting to know your family and your kids so um big shout out to you so, so thank, thank you, you again thank you um yeah so what i've experienced as a financial advisor is that after 2020 you know everyone became a financial advisor i feel like who's not a financial advisor <laughs> so <laughs> like golfers yeah <laughs> So <laughs> 2020 was the start of the golf. Anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So, so the misconception, I think, and if, uh, if anyone takes anything away, is that financial advisors, right, the, the right ones are, are not stock traders. OK. Right. Whenever people say, oh, you know, he's just going to buy and sell yeah, stocks yeah, yeah, that yeah, you yeah. want to get or yeah, yeah. whatever. No, we don't. We know my thing. I don't day trade. I hardly buy stocks or sell stocks for my clients. So I, we do invert like a holistic financial planning around your goals, right? And to go back to your question, yeah, you don't need millions of dollars. Right. You don't need hundreds of thousands of dollars. No. You just need to start a plan exactly. for the future because the hard truth is that eventually you're going to need this money one way or another. Sure. And who knows if we're going to work forever? You're not. Because... You know, uh, the sad part is not to get so down on this podcast but, today is, yeah. <laughs> is that you might need that money because things you happen. might retire because things of happen. physical things. Right? I, I think of financial planning and saving as a not like we talked earlier, wants and needs. This it, it's a need like you must save money. Yeah. And I think a lot of people see a hundred dollar bill and go. I have a hundred dollars. I'm going to spend that hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah. I see that hundred dollars and I go, I'm not going to spend any of that hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. I have a different mindset of money. People see money as something that they need to use. Yeah. I don't. I see money as something that I need to save. And I feel like if I, the more I save, the more I'll have, obviously, but what he does is he'll set you up with an account and it's minimal amounts. It's it, it, maybe even a couple hundred bucks a month, right? Like it's not, you don't have to put in thousands of dollars. Correct. Correct. So this, this money, it, it's almost like a savings account, but it grows 
I mean, it, it, if everything goes correctly in the world, and, and it will, because it has forever, yeah. but you just put in this money and instead of putting it in the bank, you put it in here and you forget about it. You just, it's just gone. You just don't even think about it. It comes, you can have it come directly from your payroll, right? Uh, no, no, not. You not can anymore. do that with your 401k. Yeah, 401k. 401k. Okay. Yeah. But this is something that you can set up on a recurring. Mine comes out of, uh, of my bank account. I don't see it. I don't think about it. It was never my money. Correct. It's so, just gone. Yeah. And, and I like it because I just know that I'm putting it away. And not only am I putting it away under my mattress, I'm putting it under my mattress, but that money's making money. And the more money you save, the more money it makes. It's incredible. And people don't know that. We're not taught that. No. We're not instructed in school like, hey, this is what you should do. This is how you should save your money. Nobody talks about this. And I feel like this whole thing, this whole creation of retirement accounts and all that was just for a select few. And they're like, hey, we got an idea how we can make our money make money, but let's not tell anybody about it. And then people got smart and they started doing it. But I would say seven out of 10 people probably don't have an account. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's probably- It's insane. Yeah, it's pretty big, yeah. I mean, and you know, and again, you know, investing is different for, for everybody. So when I tell people, I say, talk to a financial advisor or call me, I'll, yeah. you know, I'll help you. I do a lot of, I answer a lot of questions for people that don't even do business with me because I'm in the, I'm in this to help others. I feel like if I help others, they will help me. Got it. Right. So if I can help you get to a certain spot in your life, that eventually will help me get to the certain spot in my life. hundred percent. You're helping each other and you are helping them significantly more than they're helping you. You are helping them plan for their future, which is just something astronomical. We're going to talk more about what you do now, but before that we need to know how you got here. And like I said, these shows are not going to be interview shows, but I think that you have such an interesting uh, career, let's call it, yeah, it's been, it's that been. we need to talk about it. So you weren't born here. You were born in Cuba. Correct. What yeah. year? 86. 1986, you were born in Guantanamo. Guantanamo. I got it. <laughs> there you go. He's born in Guantanamo, Cuba. Not into, come away, which yeah. is right there. <laughs> into a communist regime. Now, for those of you who know what communism is, God bless you. <clears throat> for those of you that have lived in it, God bless you. But I think that the majority of people have no idea what communism is really is yeah it's not yeah I, I i will agree with you on that uh i want to ask you because i have my ideas and i have my um stories that mm -hmm. i've heard from my family but let's hypothetically say that you are a 40 year old man in cuba today okay you work do you work yeah you work Where, what do you work as most jobs will be with around the government such right? as such so like you can have jobs working uh like the panaderia right like the bread store right okay or like the bakery right the and the bakery, bakery is owned by by the government the bakery is owned by the government right. so you're not going to say hey i'm going to open up my own little restaurant bullshit well <laughs> now, now now it's a little different right they've given people a little bit but back then so let's talk about back then, back then. When, when i lived there right so you go to the bakery for your daily bread yeah Right, they give you a piece of bread. You better eat it that day, or tomorrow you could break a wall with it. Wow! Right, I mean, hey, those organic ingredients, <laughs> no preservatives. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Uh, so yeah, so most of the people work for like a city job, or if you're a doctor, which most people become doctors, you know, you work at the hospitals that are run by the government, right? And those make a little bit more money than other people. But either you you work like I had a buddy of mine who just came from Cuba a year and a half ago. And he had to hop a lot of countries to get here. Um, but he worked at the beer factory. Making beer for Making the beer. for the government. Well, for the for the country was regulated by the government. Everything's yeah. regulated by Correct. the government. Correct. So do they do you get a paycheck? You get a paycheck. And what can you do with that paycheck? You could buy stuff if there's available. So in Cuba, it's all depending where you live. So think about the ports of LA. Okay. Right? Think about everything coming there, and that's Havana. Okay. Right? And then everything trickles down. The further you live from the port, 
the, the less, less you're gonna you get. get. Oh my god! So we're in Glendora. We're about what? yeah. We're we're not getting we're, anything. We're getting like the scraps, right? Wow. So if I live in Guantanamo, which is the furthest point from Havana, oh boy. we're getting we're getting nothing. we're getting almost nothing, right? Oh my god! So the people that live in Havana are gonna be more prosperous than people that live in Guantanamo in Santiago de Cuba. You know, and, and those are bigger cities, Santiago de Cuba. You know, and you got Baracoa, where my where my grandparents were from. But what's coming in? I mean, they, they can't even bring in anything good, right? Well, well, I mean, they still have trades where like Mexico, uh, Canada. Uh, you know, they have right back in the day, we had Soviet Union. Yeah. So everything was pretty good in Cuba, even even after the revolution, because you have Soviet Union feeding a lot of stuff through it, right? Pretty good in the sense that you weren't eating dirt, Correct. but not pretty good the in, way we live. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So yeah. in comparison to the way we live, <laughs> yeah. it was not pretty good. Correct. It was pretty bad. Yeah, it okay. was pretty bad. So let's right? be clear with that. It wasn't pretty good. <laughs> Listen, it was pretty, pretty bad. pretty good for, you know, when you were it, there. It's yeah. pretty good that you're alive. Exactly. Let, let's say that. Yeah. But it's not pretty good in the sense of that you have free will and you can do what you want and you can earn yeah. how you want and this is, and even if you have can you own property can people own their so you own property so yes you do own your property you have to so you basically pass it down from generation to generation sure right so the house that i lived in cuba was my grandparents house got it that they got then we left we left it to my mom's cousin who lived next door to us because there were two men in the house so they took over this house right right and then they still live there and they eventually when they pass away, their kids will live there. But the government could say also at any time for any reason, by the way, under your house is an oil well, we need it, get out. Correct. And they'll yeah. just move you to like another house. Or or not. No, no, no. And, I mean, <laughs> they'll be like, they hey, will, hey, you will. can live yeah, here. Yeah. Even though that your house was nice and you've lived there for a hundred yeah. years, you go live in that house correct, over there correct. and it's a piece yeah. of junk. But sorry, yeah. because we, we run the show. Yeah. So Okay, so you, you, you're born there and you don't know the difference because you don't know the difference. You don't know the difference. You, you're just there. And then you turn how old? Nine. Nine years old, which is like third grade or something like that? Fourth, fourth grade. Okay, fourth grade. And, and you're going to school at this time? Going to school, yeah. And are you taught how great your government is? We're taught about the independence of Cuba. We're taught about the great things that the government did for Cuba. Uh -huh. You know, we're taught about Cuban history, Latin American history. Not too much American history. Not too much. American so you history. were taught a lot about like Spain, Christopher Columbus, you know, Central America, South America history. Does anybody Korean ever history. say, hey, listen, uh, I understand that this government did so much great stuff for us. But how come before this government, everything was great and now it sucks and everything's like falling over and it looks like shit? Does anybody say that? Yeah, there's a lot of people that say that. You know, so we had this guy growing up. I remember in my <laughs> in my blog, uh, what do we call them? We call them Filipito. OK, Filipito. And he, man, he used to get drunk and just start bad mouthing Fidel uh -huh. like no one's business. And but that could get end, you killed. But at the end, he will say, I love Fidel. <laughs> because, just, just so he could take another breath. Exactly. Because so, if you bad mouth Fidel or you bad mouth the government and somebody rats you out, they yeah, have so like yeah. they have yeah. like people listening yeah. in your community yeah. that secretly work for the government. They're like narcs or little stool pigeons or whatever. What do they call them? They're uh um, there's a name for these people. Spies? No, no, it's not spies. He's like, they're like stoolies, you know? Yeah, I, I, I don't they're know spies. That, yeah. It's yeah. the same like Russian. A narc, yeah, a narc. Yeah. And if you're heard bad mouthing the government yeah. or saying things against the government, they will say, hey, listen, this person is planning a revolution. Kill them. Yeah, so you got you to gotta remember too, right? You have people that, let's say you're a cop, right? They're, they feel a little bit above, right? Yeah. So, in Cuba, there's there's not really classes, right? There's not like a me, uh, right, middle class. Right, right. It was government class. and then people. It, yeah, it was pretty much what it is, right? You might have a little more than your than your neighbor just because, I don't know. Sure. Maybe you have someone that send you something. Sure. Or maybe you, your job paid you 100 pesos more. Right. Whatever, right? right. Um, so that's how people feel a little special, Okay. right? They feel, oh, I got a little more, yeah. right? Uh, but certain people in certain positions, you know, Maybe they didn't want to write you out. Maybe they didn't, but if they feel like they had to, right? Because if they didn't do it, then they were going to Exactly. Out. Yeah. It's right? like seeing somebody commit a murder and not say anything. And then you're like, shit, if this guy gets caught, then they're going to see me that I didn't say anything. Yeah. Now I'm going to be an accomplice. It's like that Seinfeld episode. Yep. <laughs> <At the end. laughs> That's what it is. So it's a constant, you're constantly looking over your back, whether, and it's, it's all false because people know that it's, it's all jacked up and they know that, but they can't say anything because then you're uh, you're committing treason or whatever. Yeah, so yeah, so it, it's just stuff, right? I think at the end, you know, 
when Fidel took over, there was a lot of, and, and I know a lot of stuff history because, you know, growing, going to school here, my, my one thing that I always did was whenever I had a history paper or an English paper, I always did it on Cuba. Uh-huh. Because I always said, I know more than you, teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to teach you. Good. <laughs> as you should. Use, you lived in it. You but, should know. So here's a great thing, right, about going to school here, here, like in America. I get to see it from a different angle. I get to see and read books of different events. And, and not just one side of the country telling me how it was. Right. But now I get to see it from, you know, from a different angle, right? right. Uh, so now I get to read about it. And I get to read what people that interviewed people within the Castro regime were saying right and what people were saying back then you know when batista was there yeah you know and uh when it was vegas right 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 right, right. um there was a lot of cubans that didn't want that right because they they also felt batista was also a authoritarian that was basically backed by the u.s because he was do whatever the, the u.s wanted him to do he you know he would do but he wasn't any different than fidel in the sense that he was an authoritarian right so I get to learn all this stuff and you get to learn her. Fidel wanted to do different things. What, you know, what goes wrong? Power goes wrong. Yeah. You give someone too much power. He wanted to be more socialist. But then, you know, you take Batista out, the U.S. goes out. Yeah, yeah. Everything right? goes so to So now hell. you don't have anybody backing right. you up anymore. Right. So now the country is like, hey, well, what are we going to do now? Yeah. So his brother, with Che, they have a Soviet Union accomplice. He goes, hey, we'll help. You. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And well, back then, you know, Soviet Union, Americas were fighting each other. Sure. Soviet goes, hey, best place to have a missile base, Cuba. Why? We're 90 miles yeah, from, yeah. Yeah. from the U.S. So they team up with, with Russia or whatever, the Correct. Soviet Union. Yeah, Soviet say, we're going to give you everything you want, right? That's whatever it is, right? And all you have to do is just let us, yeah. just let us be there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good luck dealing so, with those people. So that's the bad thing where he goes wrong. And this is me reading, right? This right. is not me. This is what I've read in books, sure. right? From historians, whatever people sure, want to sure. call it, right? So they're writing this book. I'm reading it. And so they say this, his brother's influencing him. Right. And they, it just kind of, you know, you kind of go down this rabbit hole and you kind of. Now you're in And it. then, but so the bad thing I think for him is he should have said, hell no. Right. And then he should have gone to America and be like, hey, this is what I want to do here. Right? I think his whole goal, he, I think he achieved exactly what he wanted. Yeah. He was well. He was exiled from Cuba too. He was in Mexico. Yeah. He started everything in Mexico. That he got help from Mexico, his government too, a little bit. He, I, so. I feel that his goal from the beginning was not to make Cuba better. He wanted to get payback and just run Cuba, and he did. Yeah. He was successful. So anyway, so you're nine years old, and how does it go from we're living here, we're we're, we're living in communism to pack your bags, we're moving to freedom. Yeah. First of all, I gotta say, I don't like Fidel. Okay, <laughs> thank you, thank you for being clear. So yeah, uh, so yeah, so I mean, we gotta go back. So my 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 sister was born in 1971. My grandparents are coming. You know, the Rule of Champions 59. My mom's born. She's a kid, and they my grandpa's twin brother works at the naval base for for the U.S. He works at Guantanamo Bay. Okay, so he gets to come to the U.S. Oh. L- years later, guess my guess my guess my grandpa to come to the U.S. Got it. Now we got my grandpa, my aunt, my two uncles, and my mom coming. Okay. Right, uh, right before they come, my like a year before, my mom gets pregnant. Mm. She has my sister, mm. um, and then it becomes kind of uh, conflicted because her husband at the time, my sister, my sister's dad, yeah. can't come. Right. So my my sister now has to stay in Cuba. So my right. mom goes, well, my 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 grandparents can be like, well, I have to, we're, we're going. Yeah, yeah, my yeah. My mom's 17 at the time. Oh, right? so she had to stay. So she stays for my oh, sister man. in Cuba, right? So my grandparents, my two uncle, and my aunt come here. They grew up here. You know, my mom grows up in Cuba as my brother. I don't know. Your mom could have taken your sister and said, we're going, right? Well, no, it's tough, right? Because, you know, you have a dad. You need permission. So my oh, dad. Oh, really? Oh. So they divorced when I was like eight years old, and my dad gave her permission for me to go. Got it. Kind of goes back to the, you know, to the Livon Hernandez situation we had. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Send yeah. back yes. to Cuba. Yeah. Because right? the mom took him without the dad. And it's and, not Levon. Levon was the pitcher. Uh, no, not Levon. <laughs> Whatever, Levon. I, I forget his name. What was that kid's name? Uh, Gonzalez. I forget that kid. Yeah. Yeah. Ilian. Ilian. Ilian Gonzalez. Yeah. Ilian Gonzalez. Okay. Yeah. Third. But Levon Hernandez was a hell of a pitcher. I have a picture with his brother, El Duque. He have a sign ball by him. Oh, my God. That's right. El Duque is his brother. Yeah. Oh, my God. Orlando. <laughs> yeah. Damn. All right. Yeah. Sorry. Go so, ahead. Anyway, so, so we, so 
So in 96, right? So it took about a couple of years, right? My, my grandpa puts the paperwork in to legally come here. It takes a while. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. You have to show proof that you can sustain now. Yeah. Me, my mom, my brother, my sister, and my brother-in-law. Okay. So five of us. You have to sustain five people, right? So we get legally, we come, we go to Havana, we go to Florida. We spend four days in Florida, and then we come to LA. Oh my God. And that's what happened. You gotta try that. <laughs> so, how much of a culture shock is it? Like, where do you, you go? Miami. You go to Miami? We're gonna go to yeah, we go to Miami. You go straight to Miami, and you're probably like, because you don't, there's no internet, there's none of that. So, you don't see this, right? You don't know what's going on. Mm -mm. It's a different world. So, I'll tell you a story real quick. When I was like seven years old, eight years old, or even nine years old, I think we, we used to talk as, as my friends and be like, man, there's gonna be flying cars in the United States. What is this, 1996? Then we barely had cars. <laughs> well, <laughs> so, and no, it's, uh, or, well, it was, it was 1995 when I came, December 14, 1995. Wow. So, uh, but it's funny how you think as a kid, right? Hell, we have all this, and there's, there's gonna be so much. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And so, yeah. Super culture shock. I mean, I get here, everything is huge. I remember, so I came, I did this, I came on this article in the LA Times when I was in high school, and they asked me that question. And the one thing I always tell people is the first, my, my first memory of the United States is on the plane from Havana to Cuba, I mean, Havana to Miami, Yeah. getting into Miami. And then it was like 11 o'clock at night. It was like midnight. Yeah, yeah. For some reason, I got there at midnight, I got here at midnight. Like, for some reason, what was that late flight? It's almost like you have to sneak into the States. Probably did. <laughs> so... Get there, man, so many lights. And when you're flying yeah. Cuba, I grew up with no electricity half the day. And now usually we didn't have lights. Wow. There'd be days where we might have some lights. Most days we didn't have Why lights. Why do you not have lights? They control it? They just turn the lights off because there's not enough power. <laughs> and you know, the lights are out, out like in Havana, but in our other, those other cities, yeah, you know. Forget it. Yeah, there's, I had no, I was telling my, so Rachel, my wife, she goes, hey, tell me, sometimes you'll be like, tell me a story about Cuba you haven't told me. Yeah. She, she goes, what do you do about showers? I said, well, I didn't shower with any water pressure. I said, we had pipes, we had sewer system. I said, I had a shower that we didn't use because there was no person. So I had a bucket and a yeah. cup yeah, yeah. and I would shower like oh, that. Wow. And, and then no she, hot water. No hot water. We have to boil the water, pour it into the bucket of cold water, make it, make it, make it warm. See, to, to interrupt you, my grandfather and my grandmother would shower at 3 p.m. I could never figure that out. And I, I, th it was their habit. Mm -hmm. But now I realize that if you showered at night, then you're cold yeah. because there's no hot water. So yeah. you're showering with average temperature water. And yeah. and listen, Cuba is a warm climate, so it's not like, oh my God, it's freezing. Yeah, correct. But, but if you shower cold, at yeah. seven, it's a little bit colder than at three. Yeah. So they would shower at three o'clock and that was their shower for the day. And they were in a routine. It was three o'clock, four o'clock, I'm taking a shower. And I, yeah. I was like, what? I don't understand this. <laughs> the but, whole day still going. <laughs> yeah, like you're not even, you're gonna go do stuff. Then you're gonna get dirty again. <laughs> and they had hot water here yeah, in, in yeah. Arcadia, but they were just in. So anyway, so so you get here and you're, you're mesmerized by the lights. I mean, the first thing I ate here was tricks. Cereal, never had cereal. So that was silly, fun. Wake up the next silly day. rabbit. Yeah, and we're like, what is this? So like, it's cereal. I was like, okay, let's try it, <laughs> you know? So it was good, it was sweet, you know? Yeah. Uh, I used to eat sugar, just raw sugar for candy. I came here with 11 cabbages. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, so, some medical system they must have over yeah, there. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, it definitely core shock. I mean, I, I mean, just, I remember the first time I went to Toys R Us. Oh man. You I remember the first time I went to a grocery store. You're like, what? Yeah. Are we, what, can we get everything? I, I would get one toy in Cuba a year. Per one year. Toy. And it was by last name. So my last name is Vargas. Oh. So I would go in there, that little toy store that the government will give toys. There'll be like nothing left. Oh my God. So I will end up with like, I don't know, um, just random stuff. A ping pong paddle. I used to make my own, I made my own scooter when I was like eight out of wood and wheel bearings. Wow. I used to. I used to cut my own sugar cane with a machete. And this I wouldn't is, even let my, I wouldn't let Ryan at seven years old. This is, th this is not the 1800s. Yeah. This is 1994. Yeah. And, and, and you're living like it's the 1800s. Yeah. That's, that's how just backwards it is. But I made my own kites, made my own scooter. Yeah. It was great. Awesome. And, yeah. and <laughs> you learned a lot, but yeah. the fact that you had to live like that in 1994, while we were starting the internet yeah. is, you know, you didn't have electricity. And we were like, hey, we have 
in Carta Encyclopedia on our, and we yeah. had computers in school and like it was a thing, it was yeah. happening. So, all right, so you get here and you go to Miami and then you go where? where where's the so next So we stop? spent four days in Miami just for like paperwork stuff, right? Because okay. you know, you come from the country. And then we come to LA because that's where our people are gonna, you know, sign okay. for us. So my grandparents lived in Alhambra. And it's English, I mean, Spanish only. You only. Yeah, I only speak Spanish. I only knew grandfather, grandmother, mother, father. And then in baseball, literally, I learned move, move over. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you come to L.A. and you live with family, yeah. I assume. Yeah. So I grew up in Alhambra. Nobody's working, right? Because you just got here. So Correct. Like so my, so, I mean, we were blessed compared to a, a lot of other immigrants that come to here. We had family that were very established already. Good. Right. Because my uncles came eight, there were nine eight and seven when they got here. Got right? it. Sort of like my age when they got here. So when we get here, they're already they're established. in their 40s, right? Yeah, yeah, they're established. Or they're like 30s, they're, they're established. So, you know, my uncle gets my brother, my brother-in-law into construction, and that's what they still do now, now you know, to this day. Uh, my sister goes back to school, gets her bachelor's, to, then, you know, then she becomes a teacher. My brother-in-law opens on his own construction company later on. I go to school, my mom works as a bookkeeper uh, at a big, big rig, repair shop okay then she worked for bank of america for a little bit um also like bookkeeping and stuff like that so yeah so for her it was more odd she came at 42 no english never really learned it uh. right gets canceled when i'm in seventh sixth grade or fifth grade oh you know still works through that yeah she's like i gotta get this kid yeah yeah right so no hair you know where's a wig imagine you got here yeah. and then next year you're here you get cancer breast cancer right so survives it through it which is good but it's 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 a crazy story Right. So, you know, you live a lot of time when your mom's like, I want to go back to Cuba. Now, now the culture shock as a kid is nothing as an adult. Wait, who said they want to go back to Cuba? My mom. At Why? 42. Because you're 42. Your whole life has been another country. You get here and you're like, dude, like it's not the same. Right. So that's why you have so many old people in Cuba to this day that they're like, I'm not going to go anywhere. Oh, well, yeah. Kids that live here, they go, hey, we want to bring you. And they're like, you know, she doesn't, she doesn't have anybody. So, you know, it takes a while. Hey, you know, you're not going to have, and to this day, she was like, ah, I wish I can go. I'm like, mom, you're going to do it in Cuba. I tell her, relax. <laughs> it, it's just, it's just the memory of it, you oh, know? Right, right, and she yeah. probably remembers that she was born, she, well, she was probably. She was born 54. So just before the revolution. Yeah. So she would remember a little bit of it. But I mean, like that cancer thing, she gets that over there and she's dead. Yeah, correct. Correct. Yeah. So. I mean, it's yes, you know, but you, you talk about the culture shock, right? So right. that's for her. I can, you can kind of have to put myself in a jail, you know, and I'm glad she did it. I'm glad she came here, you know, that definitely gave us a better, yeah. you know, but I'm glad that my grandparents, you know, and my uncle's all. You know, how long are you in a too. culture shock? Like how, when does it wear off that you're no longer in just poverty and th this regime? Like when, when do you take a deep breath and go, wow. I mean, just getting off the plane. Really? Just being on the plane, you're like, and you're is, a kid. This is nothing that I've ever experienced in my you're life. You're a kid, but you know that your life is about to change. Yeah. I mean, I was That's a kid. Cool. I remember we were our first apartment. We lived with my grandparents for a little bit. We got into in a two bedroom apartment, five of us mm. living in a two bedroom apartment. Then my sister and brother in law, you know, they, they move out. And then, but I'm in an apartment and it's great. It's yeah. Great. Yeah. You, you have electricity I mean? and yeah. hot water yeah. and like AC. carpet and the yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. Wow. So you're like, hey, this is this is great. This, I'm and living the dream. You know, poverty to me, if you think about poverty now, that's great. If you're making twenty, oh, I see year, what you mean. I see like what poverty you mean. for the U.S. Oh yeah, is it's, great for yeah, you. I know. Oh, of course, poverty <laughs> yeah. here. You're rich everywhere else. Yeah. So, okay, so you, you go to Alhambra, you start school, you start integrating, you start becoming, and you slowly, you know, start forgetting life in Cuba. And then you start, in Cuba, you were playing baseball also? I played baseball only on the streets. On the streets. No, no so parties. you get here, and are you playing, like, yeah, rec so, ball? Like Yeah, so I get here, I mean, I don't know anything about organized baseball, so my uncle puts me in baseball, 1996, I played for the, which, which I just find out, they weren't even a team yet. The Diamondbacks, Arizona Diamondbacks. Oh, I think they oh. didn't get established. You, like were the first, you were the first. You were the first. You were the first player on the Diamondbacks, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. The first player. So you you're, you start playing little league organized ball, and and how are you? And my uncle signs me up with the wrong last name. Why? Because 
just to <laughs> hide? I have two last names. Oh. You know, my last name is Robert Vargas Lobina. Oh. So he's a Lobina. So he signs me as Robert Lobina. Oh. Right? <laughs> so so it's it's not the wrong last name. Yeah, it's, it's just the, missing one. Okay. You know? So it's funny. Uh, a side story. I play Little League, right, in Alhambra. And I go to high school. In high school, I'm Robert Vargas. Oh. In Little League in Alhambra, it's Robert Lobina. <laughs> so I get this coach that coached me in Little League, comes to one of our games, and they're like, they're like, oh, this is this is Robert Vargas. He goes, that's not Robert Vargas. That's Robert Lobina. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, hey, what happened? I'm like, how to tell this story. Just call me Robert. <laughs> so so here's, but it, well, then here's a crazy part. Like, how do you get good at, I mean, who are you practicing with? I, th- this is what I think that, the parents today yeah. um, don't really understand. You don't have any, but you're you're not out playing catch with anybody, right? Like, no, you're, you're playing catch with the other kids that are out there playing baseball. I learned to play baseball from other kids on the street. My dad a in little Cuba. bit. In Cuba. But when, when you get here and now you start having to practice and play, the kids are not playing in the street here. Correct. No. Not like they did over there. No. So who, who, do you, who are you playing with? How do so, you get good? Yeah, so I just went to Little League practice. Yeah. When I would get home, I wouldn't really practice much either. I remember getting my stepdad out, or well, my dad, I call him, he's my dad now, yeah. you know, and have him just play catch with me. Right. But besides that, I would play at recess at school, at lunch at school, you know, and then I would, and then for football season, we would play football. But during baseball season, we would just play baseball yeah, as yeah. much as we can yeah. all the time. I never played catch with my parents, really. You know what I mean? Were so, you, were you, I mean, it's, you don't have to be humble. Were you the best in that league? I was not the best in the league. No, no, no. no. I wouldn't say I was the best. In when high did you school. become, really? You weren't the best in high school? I don't think I was the best. You had to have been the best on the team. I was, I was pretty good on the team. I never say that I was, the, that I was the best. I know you wouldn't say that, but you were probably the best on the team. Was there a better, you're a pitcher. I was a pitcher. At Alhambra best. High School. At Alhambra High School. Was there anybody on that staff or on that team that played at the next level and not in my year four years later we we had no Ramirez. you know he went he got drafted but on your team on my team no okay so you were the we, only one yeah so we went so another you, guy from my from my team we he went to college with me as well okay yeah, so yeah. two of you went on to play college ball yeah. what i'm trying to get at is you get good enough to be really good to play high school ball mm-hmm. and then go play at the next level who's working with you Who's teaching you anything? Nobody. So I used to just throw the ball sometimes around against the wall. Yeah. Or I will get my friends to play catch with me, right? Just, hey, let's go play catch. Let's do this, right? So I live in an apartment complex. So there's kids that play baseball with me. Okay. So we will play catch like in the parkway, you know? Like, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Like in the parking yeah. lot. And we had a huge, this it was a huge apartment complex. So we had like ponds and stuff like nice. that. We just, so, and then Little League, you know, we, we go to the park and play catch. Right. After school. Again, things that kids aren't doing. So. You know, I coached Little League this year, and I've always said that, you know, there's so much practice you can get, right? Sometimes parents be like, hey, we got to practice five times a week. Right. And it's like, that's insane because as a coach, hey, I also have a life, right? I also need to do things. Sure. Um, so I, I feel bad sometimes for some of these coaches, you know, and, and, and good for the good ones that put a lot of time into it. But, you know, uh, at home is where the kids are going to get developed because even at practice, exactly. I can't spend – Exactly. Two hours, one on one. Exactly. That right. is the most important practice is what you do on your own. Yeah. And I try to convey this to people that practice is only to implement what you've practiced at home. Yeah. Or even the next practice is to learn the, fundament, the fundamentals, right? Learn the fundamentals, learn how the game is played with your other teammates and what you do in different positions and different stuff. But to develop your throwing, your catching, your batting. Everything's at home. It's tough to do at practice. In 45 at, minutes. Correct. Even at a high school level, yes, you maybe take 15 swings during batting practice. Organized practice is nothing more than a time where you show off what you've learned at home. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of parents, God bless them, they don't know. They just go, my kid, I'll just send them to the practice and uh, they'll learn there. No. Your kid's not going to get any better. You have to practice yeah. at home. So listen, I, I didn't do a lot of a lot of practice. I will I would say that there's some kids that just have more raw talent than the other, and some kids sure. just need a lot more practice. Right. And those are the ones that I think sometimes parents need to realize. Hey, maybe my kid needs a lot more practice outside of practice. Right. Right. Um, sometimes I don't think you need a batting coach. 
so early in life, you know. But if, if you would have had somebody to practice with you, mm -hmm. or if you had an older brother that would be there practicing with you, just think about how great, how much greater you would have been. No, yeah, I mean, and, and I gotta say, say that my brother did come to my Little League games. You know, he will take me places. He will play catch, you know, if I ever needed him, but I just, you know, he worked. Right? Yeah, of course. Also, everybody worked. I Do you think that so if you would have, if, if you would have stayed in Cuba and then come here in high school, do you think that you would have been a much better baseball player? I don't know. I don't know. I, I can't even answer you that. You played more baseball in Cuba than you play here. Because that's all you had could do over there, right? Correct. But but school is a lot tougher in Cuba. It's longer. And it's longer. You're there. I mean, it's just, I mean, you, it's it's different. I can't, yeah. it's, it's hard for me to answer because I don't know. I but, hear you. I yeah, hear you. It's tough. Okay. So you, you go to Alhambra High School, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And you play four years of baseball. Four years of baseball. High school is over. What happens after that? Go to, so I get scouted by a few schools. Uh, I go to Chicago State, Chicago State University. They give me 80% right. Nice. Pay three grand a year for school. That's unbelievable. You know, so I can't say no to it. It's a Division One school, not the best, but hey, I'm playing Division One. I'm getting 80% of my school paid for. And to me, as an immigrant kid, yeah. see the struggles of your family yeah. and say, I got to get this education. Of course. Because that's what I came Nine to. Nine years ago, you didn't have electricity. Exactly. And now you have a 80% <laughs> ride. Exactly. I mean, so, welcome to America. Like, that's yeah. that's unbelievable. So you go there, you play some ball, you, you graduate, and then you so, decide, I'm coming back? or No, yeah. So I graduate in 2008 during the... Stock market fallout. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah, I remember that. Graduate with a marketing ba bachelor's in marketing, no jobs in direct marketing. I get into sales. My first job is door to door sales. To this day, I have a special warm place in my heart for people that are selling not in my what? Door. Selling office supplies. I went door to door to businesses selling office supplies. My biggest sale was a printer. Then we transitioned with that same company. I didn't do it more than a year to you selling Uverse. So then I was selling AT&T Uverse. Oh, I remember that. I so remember that. When they first came out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is in Chicago still. Oh my God. Right, so in Chicago, and then I get into credit card processing, so merchant services. This is after college. After college. Got it. Right, so after college, I get into merchant services, become an assistant general manager, then become the general manager, all within two years there. Then I moved back home. Wait, 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 yeah. go back to that. You become the what? Assistant general manager. And you started? And, and That's a sales guy. First. Instantly, a year yeah. later, a year. Are we talking? Yeah, about I mean, within like three months. <laughs> Is that typical? No, <laughs> it's not typical. It's not typical. Why? So, why you? Why do you think they chose you? I, listen, the way that I did it, I don't recommend anyone doing it. I don't know if it'll work anymore. So hey, maybe my that manager, he was a great guy. So I three months in, I'm like not making money. It's commission only. I'm like I'm leaving with a with a roommate. That with a buddy of mine from college who played baseball, okay. who had an apartment, who had a studio. Okay. He said, yeah, you can stay with me for a couple of months, whatever you need to do, right? Yeah. I said, cool, thanks, you know? So I'm like telling this, my boss, like, hey, listen, I gotta get another job because I'm not making money here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And he had told me already, like a week before, hey, our VP who interviewed me for the position says that you'd be a good assistant manager for me because I need one. Because you have your bachelor's in okay. business, this okay. and that. So I held it against him, <laughs> a 21 year old. And I said, hey, Ronnie, if you don't hire me as your assistant manager, I'm I quit. Out. <laughs> and then he goes, what do you mean? He goes, you don't have experience. And I told him, I said, anything I need to learn, I'll learn from you. Right. So he goes, let me call you back. He calls me back like an hour later. He goes, okay, you're come right. tomorrow. You're my assistant manager. <laughs> so there, I, went, I went from making commission only yeah. and hardly making any money right. to making 500 bucks a week Salary. plus 10% commission from the office. Okay. So I went from never managing anybody to managing 20 people. At 21 years old. And nine years earlier, you had no electricity. <laughs> <laughs> and no butter. Remember that butter No butter. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so now you're working at this company. Now you're assistant manager and then manager. So, yeah. So then but you he, kill him. So then and he, he leaves. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he left. And then okay. I became the I became the manager. My mom gets my mom gets pretty sick. So I go, you know what? I'm not going to be here. I, I never plan on living in Chicago for the sure, rest of my life. Sure, it's too cold. Sure. So I moved back home and... 2010. Okay. I get a job at Everest College as an admissions advisor. Wow. Right. At a 
how to technical school, basically, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm getting kids into college that don't want to go to junior college. Or right, college. right, Everest. Yeah, yeah, Everest. Yeah. Um, I leave Everest like two and a half years later. I get a call from my other company in Chicago. The corporate trainer there gets a job in a company in California. Okay. She goes, hey, they're looking for an agent director. I referred you. So Westlake Village, I'm living in Temple City. Oh my God. I live in <laughs> Temple City. Oh, West I go to Lake West Village Lake Village is now. on the other side yeah. of the valley, yeah. like almost getting way out there. Thousand Oaks, basically, an hour yeah. almost away. Yeah. And with traffic, forget it. Yeah. It's a three-hour drive on so a Friday. So I said I'll work from six a.m. to two thirty p.m. Or I think I work from like six to I think I work from seven to four. Or and this is three. how old are you? So now? I can beat traffic. Twenty-three. Right? I'm twenty-four at that point, right? And then I worked there about a year, and then I get recruited to be a national sales director for another credit card processing. So now I'm back into credit card processing, by the way. So now, now, I'm, now I'm commuting from Temple City to Carlsbad. Stop. Now, every day? Every day. Oh my God. I have to fill up when gas prices were 550. What do you think? Putting $72 every other day in my car. So you're working to pay the gas? I'm basic, almost basic. Oh my God. How does that, how do you even justify that? I justified it with the same way people justify getting crazy jobs is, hey, there is, potential. I'm doing this to another level. There's potential because I got there, I knew a lot. They, I became, I went from agent director to national sales director, right? Now I'm managing higher class salespeople, okay. right? And they're like, we're gonna open up, this an up and coming uh, company now, like young guys, right? Okay. Uh, so I was 20, six now maybe yeah 25 no like 26 27 okay and they're like hey and these guys are 32 35 okay right? and they're going to open up an office in la i'm like oh, dude that's so much closer thank god he goes we want you to be the vp we oh, want to be the president you know of that office and i was like hell yeah let's go let's go long story short i know way too much about the industry i bring them this one of my reps from chicago calls me i said yeah i got this company you should come work for us uh, and he's like hey i got this deal in miami Oh my God. Where the deals go. <laughs> yeah. So he goes, I got this thousand cap company. They want to get wireless credit card processing. I said, let's do it. Owner flies out there, meets my, meets my guy. They get the deal done. He comes back. He goes, oh, we got it done. And I was like, great. My contract, 15% commission and residuals. Yeah. On any deals that I bring in. Yeah. He goes, hey, we have to cut you out. Oh my God. <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> he goes, the owner wants a cut. And I said, great, that's good. Give him your cut. Exactly. <laughs> I said, I'm not gonna give away my 15% no. that's in our contract. And you linked up the deal. Exactly. And then I said, you don't have this deal without me because my guy will go somewhere else. I said, this deal's only good with me in it. And he goes, okay, we'll give you 5%. I said, no. Nah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So it just didn't work out. So I said, okay, peace. And I started my own credit card processing company after that. <laughs> Did you get, you didn't get your cut? I didn't get my cut. Wow. The deal didn't go through because when I left, my guy said, I'm out. That guy that cut him out, his name is Revenga. <laughs> Revenga is dead. Sinvergüenza. <laughs> That's exactly what that is, man. Sinvergüenza. So what I'm hearing is that you have all this experience and all I can think about, because in the last 48 hours, I've talked to two different entities that have told me, three different entities that have told me how difficult it is right now for them to get employees. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. People just don't want to work. And I think what it boils down to is that they can do this. They can have a podcast. They can dance mm -hmm. on TikTok. Yeah. They can sell uh, shoes as an influencer. And I'm not saying that any of that is wrong. I'm just saying that 24 year olds now, 25, 21, 18, they have options. Yeah, so many more options. They have we options. Can. And we, in that genre, in that era, 20 years ago or 25 years ago, we had to go to work. I had to go work at a Christmas tree lot yeah. in Christmas to get money to buy gifts during Christmas. Where now, this kid dances on TikTok, a couple million people see it, he sells a t-shirt, he's whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying what he's doing is wrong. I'm just saying it's different than it's the different. way yeah, that I mean, we, we did it. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, it's a little different, but you know, it's progress, right? We always want to see progress being done. And but I don't the think old that, school guys are always going to be, hey. Yeah, you're always going to be upset and, oh, yeah. we did it different. Yeah. But here's what's going to happen. Everybody 
is going to want to take because that's essentially the easy road out. Mm -hmm. You don't have a schedule. You don't have a job. Yeah. You do whenever you want. You sell how much ever you want. And then what's going to happen? Your toilet's going to back up. Your roof's going to leak. Who are you going to call? Because everybody's on TikTok. Yeah. The plumbers, the electricians, the mechanics, the people that in our era was like, yeah, yeah, go be a plumber. You mm -hmm. know, like whatever. You're, you're, they were nobodies. Yeah. A plumber's going to charge you $1,000 to unclog your toilet in the next five years because nobody's going to know how to do it. Yeah. The trades, you're going to see in the next five, 10 years, 15 years, all these kids that are dancing on TikTok that don't know how to do a damn thing. And listen, I, I make I make part of my living online. So I'm not I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. I'm just saying that there's going to be a complete shift in you're an, you remember it used to be like, oh, you're he's a mechanic, you mm -hmm. know, like, or he's an electrician or he's whatever. Those guys are gonna be rolling because there's only gonna be a few of them that know how to do it. Yeah, I mean, honestly, uh, trade schools, the right trade schools, right, are still are still a hot commodity. When I say trade school, I mean, listen, not too good, but like, if you go like actual trades, maybe like, a, you know, medical billing, medical assisting is tough for me to get to get yeah. behind because I think it's too expensive, they right. don't pay enough coming right. out of college. But uh, medical, medical billing, if you do like HVAC, if you do like, like you said, like mechanic work, yeah, yeah. anything that's hands on, yes. mainly like that, yes. outside of the medical field, maybe even pharmacy tech was a great one back then, which I think is still good. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're right. Uh, and the funny thing is that trying to be a social media influencer is tough. It's tough. I think they work sometimes harder than regular people because if you're a mechanic if you're even a financial advisor right the market closes at 1 p.m right, right, my time right right so i can't really do anything else market related sure after 1 p.m sure so you have a lot of financial advisors that one clock they're done, done right um so what do we do you know we do uh we, we look our clients portfolio see see what we need to do sure for the next day sure, right? sure 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 have meetings with clients still afterwards, understood right hey we got to rebalance it. it's busy you know, work yeah yeah it's busy work at the end right. right but then you put in your time and then you're and then you're and then you're done let's say five o'clock you're done right you don't think about it anymore right okay or if you do you know but but as an influence like man what can i do constantly constantly and what's tomorrow you know, what's the next day and how do i get four this shoots a day yes 8 p.m Oh, I got this great idea. I have to go do it. You're to always me, it's on. Like, oh, that's a great idea. I'll do it tomorrow. You're you're always you're on. Awesome. You're always on. And the difference is the difference is when you are a plumber, when you are a trade, when you are something, the people come looking for you. Exactly. They call you and say, "I need you." Yeah. An influencer, you need to say, "You need me." Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're not looking for you. You need to show yourself yeah. to them. So. Yes, it's getting the market is for that industry influencing and this and the other is getting harder every single day. It's getting there's more and more people getting into it. And yes, if you are if you are a somebody who is a parent of a young child, we have this mindset that maybe being a plumber is a bad idea. No, it's or great. a roofer. Yeah. It roofer is you know it, that's what it, it was. It was be a doctor or be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. That's that will. That's what we were. Be a doctor. Be a yeah, lawyer. Be yeah. be something. You know, very top yeah, notch. Yeah. And now it's like, hey, maybe you do become a, a well, whatever. That's somebody that goes and fixes something that these people don't know how to fix. Yeah. And I mean, I, I have a house in Chino Hills right now that I had a guy who was going to come clean and paint and this and the other. There's a million people that used to clean and paint and this and the other nobody yeah. i mean luckily i got somebody but it's not common anymore it's just the thing again i think it goes back to what you said right looking for that quick money looking for that quick thing and it, it comes back to people don't have long-term imagination anymore i think right long-term visual yeah of what, yeah, yeah, what yeah. it's right now like if you right if now. you start as a let's say since we're talking about plumbers if you start as a plumber dude one of the hotter hardest jobs ever. I've done my own plumbing yeah. for whatever I can do. Oh, it's a disaster. And it's difficult. I mean, there's times when I'm like, let's just call a plumber <laughs> because I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's usually right? what people do. Yeah. So, but here's the thing. Hey, you start, you start as a plumber. Maybe you open up your own shop. Now you hire a couple of plumbers. Maybe you open up another shop. Maybe yeah. now you have four vans. 
now you have now you went from that so-called dirty job right to now you're the business owner now the business owner and now you're you're mentoring other people to be potentially be their own business owner 100 percent right and i think that's where you know your upbringing takes you this is where i'm going with this the, your upbringing has taught you and taught me work yeah that's why you were driving to carlsbad yeah any other kid in that era they tell them to drive to Carlsbad. They go, what are you talking about? Who's Carl? That sounds far. <laughs> He's I'm bad. not going. He's bad. <laughs> but you're like, hey, I got to go to work. Yeah. Because that's all we know. Yeah. I got to go to work. My dad used to tell me. <laughs> my dad would tell me. We'd tell him, hey, listen, you know, go check this out. You, you don't feel good or whatever. He goes, I don't have time to die. I got to go to work tomorrow. <laughs> you know, <laughs> And, that, and that, 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 that's just all we knew. Like. You just got to go to work. My dad's been retiring for two years now. Yeah, you just got to go to work. Yeah. You just got to go. Like, we don't know anything else. So the, the point I'm making is that the eras are no longer. The, now the kids are not going to work. I'm yeah. not going to go to McDonald's for $17 an hour when I can sell 40 pairs of shoes on TikTok and make three grand. And I don't freaking blame you, yeah. to be honest. I don't. I don't yeah. blame you. Yeah. So we're going through a major shift. And I want to know from from you, somebody who has seen the entire spectrum. You, I mean, twenty years ago, how old are you? Thirty seven. So thirty years ago, you had no electricity, and now you're sitting here telling people what to do with their money, which is amazing, right? <laughs> from growing up with no money, yeah, and that's the number one reason that. Not the number one reason, but a big reason as why I said it in the very first sentence. That's why I trust you with this, because I know how you grew up and I know that you value it because the person that has it, yeah. they don't value theirs. Why would they value yours? Mm -hmm. So I think that your outlook on life is perfect for what you do because you understand the dollar. You mm -hmm. understand how important it is to have money. Yeah. And not have money and not be controlled by the government and the government gives you your money and takes your money and tells you how much you can earn in this and the other. So I think the position that you have now is almost, I mean, it's completely opposite of how you started. Yeah. A hundred, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, a hundred percent. I mean, um, it is, it is very, I, I honestly look at my client's money like I am taking care of like the most important thing in the world for my clients because I know that every cent counts. And there's some clients that are more easier than others. Sure. There's clients that look at their accounts like twice a, a day. And, you know, they'll call me if it's down a dollar, you know. But uh, but for the most part, you know, uh, I'm a financial advisor, also uh, a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Yeah. Well, <laughs> listen, I, I, like, I've told you numerous times. And I'm not I'm not super sophisticated on the market. I hate everything that has to do with taxes. I hate all the forms and the registration and permits and this and the other and rules and regulations. I don't know any of that. Mm -hmm. And when you call me and you ask me something, I specifically say, do whatever you would do. And to me, that is the ultimate peace of mind because if I can tell you that, I don't even know if I'm allowed to tell you that, right? I have to give you the okay? Yeah. Okay, well then I say, what would you do? And then you tell me, I think you should do this, right? You yeah. can say that. Well, we, yeah, yeah. They're different account, different things. Yeah. Whatever. But the fact of the matter is, you're still conservative in your life the same way that you're conservative with people's money. Correct, yeah. Which is everything. That is everything. I would rather make $11 than lose 405 yeah, yeah. No doubt. Even if if the upside was I could make 700 but I could lose 4 or 5, I'll still take the 11 bucks. Yeah. I, I every day I would take the 11 bucks. This is why I think um, there was some like when I hear about people that lost money in the pandemic investing and like yeah. crypto or other stuff and or like the meme stock and and you talk to them and it's like, "Well, how much did you invest?" and they go XYZ and they're like, I was up this much. And then like, you were up a thousand percent. Why didn't you sell? Oh, I wanted to get to. 5, yeah, they're greedy. It's and, greed. 
but I was like, "What? you thought you were going to become a millionaire with this amount that, that you invested? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Like the people that became millionaires took like everything they possibly had, threw it there, and then they were like, I got to get out. Um, I want to ask you something else that just came into my mind because if, if, you, if you know Robert, then you know. But Robert, you know, he's a golfer, obviously. And Robert hits the ball very, very far. And I was shocked when I learned that you were – pitcher but i assume that you could hit also yeah i was a pretty good hitter i mean i think i became a better hitter even after college okay yeah. so but you hit the golf ball very very far like there's there's a few of you you know king lou you louis dad and surprisingly that guy that we played with last week oh yeah matt he, yeah. he smashed the ball i couldn't he believe that dude. um but you, you're you're a very aggressive player right like you have a very wild and i was more aggressive before we met <laughs> yeah now, yeah yeah he tells me he goes i'm swinging smooth now you should see this guy swing smooth he starts a mini hurricane when he swings but um let's talk a little bit about golf let's 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 talk about it you're a baseball player your whole life you grow up in cuba golf probably exists in in the 1.001 percent yeah, I didn't Cuba. know what golf was in Cuba. Right. So you come here, you're not exposed to it. You don't know Tiger Woods. You don't grow up yeah. with Tiger Woods. You have no concept of who Tiger Woods is. You don't care. And Tiger Woods, for my generation, is what got most people into golf. Mm -hmm. Luckily, my dad liked Chi Chi and Lee Trevino and Arnold Palmer. And I, I, I knew those guys. Yeah. But between them and Tiger, I knew nobody. I got to know those guys actually later on in life, like maybe like 10 years ago. So yes. And I got more into golf. Yes. That's funny. So, <laughs> so what is it about golf now that you get here, you play ball your whole life, and at I'd probably say at 30 years old, you probably started playing golf, right? So I started playing golf at 21, right out of college. Oh, okay. Uh, so, so my friends, in, when we got out of college, I got a couple of friends that stay in Chicago, and, uh, and one says, hey, let's go play golf one day. Okay. So I played golf for the first time when I was like, 11 years old with my uncle at Glen Oaks here. Oh, and I okay. could only hit a driver. <laughs> and I'm trying to hit it over the time, fence. One well, one time we did like three holes, and I was like, "This is yeah." Terrible. Where's the pitcher? Yeah, yeah this is <laughs> yeah. terrible. Let's get out of here. Didn't play golf again until I was 21. I want to say, and I, you know, and I tell my buddy, I said, "Dude, we shot like 200 that day." He goes, "No way." I said, "Dude, we shot like 200 that day." There was no way because we went from never playing golf, only playing baseball. Right. We played like baseball golf you know when you play an, an, an yeah, yeah, yeah 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 and we went from not playing golf to playing golf and then he was like i was like we were terrible i said we will hit a ball like 350 yards <laughs> straight and then the other ones the other 299 <laughs> we're going you know, 250 yards yeah. the other way <laughs> so you you're so, you're resilient obviously yeah. so you get out there you start playing golf and you probably didn't care and at some point, at some point, you go, okay, I, I got to get better at this game. Yeah. So golf to me, you know, when you start playing it, when you watch on TV before you play golf, it's boring. When you start playing it and you have, and I say, the slightest bit of competitive edge. Yes. That you have, golf sucks. Yes. Because it'll bring it out of you. Yes. And, and then the one time you hit the ball good, yeah. you're like, I can do that every time. <laughs> <laughs> I figured it out. Yeah. I have to do that every time. If I did it once, I can do it every time. Sure. I used to tell people, I know when I hit the ball and I hit it wrong. I know what I did. In golf, I was like, I have no idea. <laughs> now I'm learning what I'm doing wrong. Sure. Right? Now I have it. more feel yeah. about it. So, yeah. So, to get, so I'm playing Sunday League Baseball still. I'm still playing golf here and there. And then, you know, but I'm getting, I pitch. And Sunday, the yeah, next day, I'm blown out. Yeah, yeah, blown out. So, and then, you know, we have Ryan. We have Jaden. We have Ryan. And then. And I go, man, I told Rachel, I said, hey, I'm going to stop playing baseball. She's like, oh, my God, thank God. I said, I'm just going to stick stick with golf. She goes, and then oh, when no. I said that, I said, okay, I'm going to start taking it serious. Okay. Because, you know, I wasn't taking it serious. Sure. I was, still, I was taking messing baseball around. serious. Because baseball was still yeah. The, the, yeah. The, the girl. Yeah. Um, so then I started taking more serious. I went and got some lessons from my pitching coach from high school. Oh, wow. Who's a golf pro at Brookside. Anybody go see him, Coach Watt? Go see really? him there. He's great. Your pitching coach? My pitching coach in high school, who played professional baseball, became a golf pro. Uh, Wears the high trousers and everything? Like real old school kind of guy? Mm, no, young guy. Young guy, I won't say he's got to be in his four, late 40s, maybe mid 40s. Oh, huh, I don't know him. I, what? I'll send you the... The only, the only guy I know at Brookside is, I don't know his name, but he's a white guy and 
he's probably late fifties now and, or maybe early sixties. And he has a very classic style. Mm -hmm. He wears like high waisted. No, no, no. That's not him. No. Okay. Anyway, so you go see him, he gives you some tips and whatever and then you say okay i'm gonna start yeah playing. so i started playing playing a lot better i went to him maybe like three or four times yeah um uh, then you get deep into the rebel of youtube golf <laughs> yeah. yeah there's a guy that i watch on <laughs> yeah. there looks looks a lot like me you gotta swing the boat <laughs> yeah. start the boat my man start the boat and swing yeah. the v so then you know and then you start taking it serious you start really looking at yourself more you join this club called tropicana there you go right and Been then there. you start taking it even more serious <laughs> yeah. because then you had to get a handicap yeah. And then you're like, man, I got to, you know, I got to, and then you meet some great guys and yeah. you start playing golf and they want to get better. So you want to get better. Yeah. So I think if you surround yourself and right. this goes not only for golf, I think in life, if yeah. you surround yourself with people, you don't have to be as good as them or as better as them. But if you surround yourself with people that are better than you or trying to be better, you, they will push you to be better. If you keep surrounding yourself with people that are negative, not going anywhere and just bringing you down. It, it, it will, for some reason, for most people, yeah. hinder your growth. Oh, for sure. For sure. And and there's a lot of people that say, you know, I, I don't care how I play. Even guys in the club, you know, I, I don't care. I, I don't play for score. I, I played for a social event. I Okay. So why why are you throwing your clubs? Why, why are you so mad when you miss that putt? Why are you so pissed off when you play poorly if you don't care? Oh, I, I, I was just upset about, you know, that. But everybody cares. Yeah. Everybody wants to get better. Exactly. So that's a that's false that people say, oh, I don't care. I'm here. But you can be there for the friends. I go for the friends also. Friday mornings. I go Friday mornings because it's fun. I get to hang out with you guys. We walk. We talk. Those are that's yeah. some of the best times for me. That Monday Night Mayhem. Like, I love that stuff because it's big groups. I like golf in big groups. And a lot of people don't get to experience big group golf. Yeah, it's fun. Friday it's mornings, fun. we have 15, 20 people sometimes in a group. Monday Night Mayhem, 8, 10 people in a group. It's totally awesome. Yeah. Most people go, they play maybe two people that they know and then one regular strand. You know, like, there's no, there's no family environment. But I do like that. But I also give a shit about what I score. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I want to play well. I don't want to be the jerk that, yeah. you know, shoots 100. So... That's why I don't I don't even drink during golf anymore. When I was younger, I used to go out and we used to drink a yeah, lot. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. Now I might have a whiskey and coke. Yeah. In on the back nine and maybe one. Right. Yeah. No, I I don't drink either that much. I'll have one, maybe two, maybe three. I'll have a cigar, and and I enjoy the process of it. Yeah. But I'm not pounding beers. Yeah. Correct. I'm not I, taking I can't a shot do that because. I never did that during baseball either. I always drank the beers after the game. Yeah. I would got guys that drink beer during the game. Really? And they were good, man. They Sunday? played good. Sundays? Sunday league, man. These guys, they're just veterans. <laughs> I'm drinking <laughs> and playing baseball, you know? <laughs> I couldn't do it. I no, couldn't do it. No, As no. a young buck, I say I'm a young, I can't do it. I, I've I'll never have done two that. beers and it's 98 degrees. I'm going to be like, oh, I will throw in my chew with a bubble yeah. gum wrap. Yeah, there you go. That will relax me. But I will have the beers with the guys after, you know. There's people uh, that love beer, man. They love it. You know who loves beer? Nacho. Nacho loves beer. Mm -hmm. And I love I love that he loves it. Yeah. Because I can't drink beer anymore. I love, just, yeah. I love the ritual of him drinking beer. Mm -hmm. I think it's so awesome yeah. that he loves it so much. Yeah. If I had a beer, like the other night, Monday night, I had a beer. It was great. I was done. Yeah. He just keeps drinking them. Because each one is as satisfying as the next one. Yeah. Yeah. If I had three, I'd be like, God, I'm done with this. Like, I had this right here. I, I don't want any more. Like, yeah. I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. I will have three or four old fashions, some rum on the, uh, some rum on the rocks. Oh, jeez. I have a couple of those. Take it easy. You know? <laughs> but the beer just fills me up. <laughs> so let's talk about your favorite golf course of all time. But oh. before we do that, hold on. You brought something here. Let, let's try this. Tell me what this is. This is pudding de pan. Bread pudding, oh but Cuban style, Look at this. which is you eat it cold and it's very dense. It's dry. It's now wet. Right. And it's it's made like a flan, but with bread. It's just amazing. And you made this. I made it. I mean, I, I, you're on, a I only you're bring a chef, the things bro. that I make. You're a chef. <laughs> you brought me some really, really good stuff. Let me so I brought you because that thing goes quick at the house. I would assume so. Is there raisins in here? I put raisins in there. Oh my God, bro. 
No, it's, and it's, and it's tough because wow. we like it cold. Some people like to warm it up, and I'm like, you're ruining it. I like it cold. Yeah, you can't have it warm. You know, some people like it warm, so I let them eat it the way they want. And they say, as long as they say it's good, it's good. No, but it's better cold. It's cold, better cold. Wow. Because it's not wet, oh. right? So, so it's oh. dry. Oh my god! It is but it's still moist. <laughs> what is a crunch in there? That's at the, the top. The top. Yeah. Oh my god! And then there's caramel at the bottom, too. Bro, this is fantastic. Yeah. I could eat this whole thing. You want to just do the show? And I'll, just, <laughs> I'll just give you one of these every once in a while. Well, ladies and uh -huh. gentlemen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, no, man, I am, um, I'm very, again, very, very happy that you invited me, you know, to do this. I think this is great. This is the most uh, internet famous I will ever be in my life. Because <laughs> I... Uh, <laughs> I Listen, <laughs> I don't need you to be internet famous. In fact, I don't want you to be internet famous. I want you to have a big clientele. But you stay in your office and make sure my money makes yeah. money. And leave the internet thing to me. So, let's talk about your favorite golf course of all time. I haven't played many, many. Uh, I I do like Glen uh, Oaks. The <laughs> Glen, Glen Oaks is not, not bad. I, I hate Arcadia Part Three. <laughs> oh, garbage. come on, man! Garbage. <laughs> I love it, bro. That's my that's one of my uh, favorites. I love that. Uh, the Grand Golf Club was great. Aviara was great. Okay. Uh, both in San Diego. Uh, I got to say, Slim Chef told me about Hidden Valley compared to uh, Oak Creek. Right? Uh, Oak Quarry? Oak Quarry. Oak yeah. Quarry. And I got to say, I do like it better than Oak Quarry. Do you? Yeah. It was, it, you know. Um, yeah, I'm not a big a Oak Quarry guy. We went over there. Yeah. Oak, I think it's a little overrated. It's I think. totally overrated. Yeah. And sorry, Oak Quarry, but. Yeah. I'd rather it, play it's San like $400 Dimas. now, too. Yeah. I'd rather play San Dimas. I played, I used to play Oak Quarry uh, a lot. And it was like, you know, 48 bucks mm -hmm. or something like that. Long time ago. And I looked the other day, it was like $295 to play Oak Quarry. I said, mm -hmm. what are you talking about? Yeah. It's not that great. Hidden Valley is a pretty close, you can compare them, let's mm -hmm. just say. And it's half the price. And, and Hidden Valley is a lot better. Um, but I did play recently. Yes. The Paiute courses in oh, Vegas. Oh, yeah, in Vegas. And those are beautiful. There's a lot of good golf in Vegas. And, and I, our, our Tropicana guys in Vegas are having one at Desert Pines, October 5th tournament. So all you... Uh, Vegas people get in touch with Chris or Kevin Nahani, sign up for that. It's a two man scramble, but you don't bring your partner. You get assigned a partner. Oh, so you're either going to make a best friend or you're going to make <laughs> an enemy, <laughs> but no, it'll be fun. It, it, it's all in good times over there. and They're having a good time. Um, so anyway, to wrap this up, I want to, to tell you all that you don't have to be a local and to, to uh, take advantage of, Robert services. And like I said, I'm not here to pitch Robert. I really am not. But I do think that he not only values his clients, he works for them. And to go back to what we were talking about an hour ago, the non-work ethic, this guy comes from pure work ethic, from baseball to his job, his family, making bread, <laughs> making uh what do they call those things that you made me the the cutting board oh, the cutting boards yeah the, 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 the guy does everything and everything's good because he understands what we maybe don't understand growing up here that we take things for you know we take advantage of the system and we take things for granted and you hit the light switch and the light goes on and imagine that as a seven eight year nine year old you turn it on and nothing happens like you grow up different. So if you're starting your financial journey or you're in it, I was in it. I was deep in it. And I decided this is a better fit for me. And it's been a year. It, it's been a year. And I I don't check the account regularly. But when I do, I, I see growth and, and substantial growth. And, and I'm happy with it, you know. So thank you for doing a great job. And thank you for being a quality member and a quality uh, citizen of of this country and helping people and and I value that. So no, thank I you, appreciate brother. you, brother. Appreciate it, yeah. This is Robert Vargas. I'm going to put all this information in the description of this video and contact him if you have any questions. Questions are still free, right? Questions are always free. <laughs>
<laughs> Questions are always free. So if you have, unless your name is Vic Fonseca. <laughs> Vic always going to get brought up. Vic, you're going to get brought up in every episode. Vic always has questions. Vic's going to ask you questions. So what do you think I should do? I have like $7. What do you think I should do? Should I spend it? I'm just kidding, Vic. I love you. I I had to do it. But um, yeah, if you have any financial questions about anything that you're doing or how to start your journey in the financial world, meaning you need to save some money, man. Save some money. Please listen to me. Save some money. You're going to need it. And he's the guy to help you with it. So all the information will be in the description below. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being here. Thank you, you, Frankie Micheladas, for supplying the cups. Nate from San Dimas, my condolences. You're my brother. I love you. Condolences. And um, we will see all of you next Friday because these air on Friday. Friday, Friday. 7 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. I don't know what time that is where you live. It's 7 o'clock where I live. So we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank you.